Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Orthopod. I have a very, very special guest today, someone who I've been uh, really excited to uh, chat with since the very first time that he and I interacted about a year ago. This is Adam Schultz. He is a professional adventurer, fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and an author of three national best-selling adventure books. These include Alone Against the North, A History of Canada in 10 Maps, and his most recent book, Beyond the Trees. His career has included mapping rivers, leading expeditions, numerous archaeological digs, photographing elusive and rare wildlife, and a recent film, Alone Against the Arctic, documenting his near 4,000 kilometer solo journey across Canada's Arctic. But his greatest love, however, is simply spending life and time in the outdoors. Welcome, Adam. Oh, thanks for having me on the show, Mo. Um, let me just start with, if I could, the quote, or I shouldn't say it's a quote, but it's it's the opening line of your uh, book that I've I've enjoyed all your books, but the, you know my first uh, introduction to your work was Alone Against the North, and in that chapter one, your introduction, you basically say, I think I I think I always knew I was destined to become an explorer. Do you think people are hardwired for adventure? Can someone uh, my age suddenly say, okay, I'm going to take on this adventurous spirit, or is it or are you born with it? Uh, I like to think anyone could become an explorer. Anyone can go out at their front door and have an adventure. I think partly it's the human spirit that we're curious about the world around us and we want to know what's beyond the horizon. So I like to say that anyone can become an explorer, um, regardless of your background or how old you are or where you come from. Um, I do know that there's been a little bit of research if you want to get into the, I guess, the more scientific side of things. National Geographic right. did publish a story. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, a while back looking at um, thrill seekers, which is more of the, uh, the adre adrenaline junkie side of things, but the people right. who do extreme whitewater kayaking and go over waterfalls and uh, all that kind of stuff. And they, they did suggest that there was an actual um, rare gene that those people had, the evil Knievel types who jumped the Grand Canyon or parachute or skydive. And, uh, but I don't necessarily see that as, as, uh, as the same thing as being an explorer. I think an explorer can be a much broader category. It could include anyone who's, who's curious about the world uh, around them. I mean, you didn't even have to go on an expedition. It could be someone with a microscope exploring the invisible world or right. um, exploring birds in their backyard. You know, uh, if you've ever you've spent time with birders, they get excited just um, discovering a new bird they haven't seen before. So I think exploration takes many different forms and pretty much anyone I think could become an explorer. You know, the one thing that I always, you know, when you, when you look at the sort of the way Hollywood has romanticized exploration and the early exploration, whether it was, you know, the first ascent of big mountains or whether it's, the you know, um, exploring the Amazon in the early days, there always seemed to be hand in hand. The explorer was someone who was documenting a new reality uh, and, and sharing that reality with the rest of the world. How much of that, how much of your writing has been a part of that? So, I mean, I'm sure there are people and we know them who aren't necessarily at your level of adventure or exploration, but they say, you know what, I'll go on a hike, I'll go on a, a multi-day hike, but it's for me. Uh, I, I, they're not necessarily journaling it. They're not necessarily looking to ex uh, identify new pathways or document new maps. How much of that has been important for you, the, the, the whole scientific aspect of exploration? Well, I do both. I mean, I, I'm always doing wilderness journeys and I don't always publish them or write about them. Sometimes okay. I have my favorite little spot out in the woods and I just want to keep it a secret and not tell anyone because it's my quiet yeah, little yeah. place to uh, daydream away uh, my time and do what I like. Uh, but exploration, when I got involved with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, um, the scientific side of things was very important. I mean, to a geographical society, or any of those organizations that fund and sponsor this kind of work, these expeditions, um, publishing is all part of the package that you have to publish your findings or otherwise you're not really engaged in exploration. You're just doing self-indulgent travel because you're not producing any results right. anyone can use. So you have to bring back uh, findings, whether it's um, you know geography, cartography, flora and fauna, geology. There's so many different facets, archeology, span ornithology, um, but you have to bring back something usually to satisfy uh, a geographical society that's putting up the money to fund the expedition. So how much of, of like when you look at your three books, 
All of those books currently are available in stores and are certainly available, I presume, through standard places that you could find them online? Yeah, Indigo, Amazon, any okay. Canadian bookstore, independent bookstores in Canada. Okay. Right. So, I mean, having gone through them, um, I have a pretty good sense of the type of, you know, really like, like the amount of intellectual and personal effort you put into thinking through the work you're doing. Um, and I don't think it any way by any means is it's glorifying adventure. I think in many ways it's talking about the real grit it takes to do what you do. What for you have been some of the big memorable findings, um, you know, of, of these of these expeditions? Because these are fairly long expeditions and fairly intense expeditions. I suspect not everything is success. You know, in research on, my, on the research side, we, we have more failure than success. But I'm sure there are moments for you that stick out. What, what were those moments where you felt this was worth all of it well there's uh there's many ones that stay fresh in my mind but i love the natural world so getting to see the natural world in all its uh, majesty you know wild right. and untamed um, <laughs> is probably the thing that i cherish the most that's what really um, fires up my soul and gets my blood flowing and right. all memories are usually some sort of encounter um, with wild animals or just nature and all its majesty i have some really vivid memories of my journey alone across the arctic of encountering Arctic wolves and having wolves come up to me and, uh, you know, a whole pack of wolves, four little pups and a mother and a father following me along a riverbank and, you know, having an Arctic wolf look you in the eyes is a pretty special moment. Uh, you know, I love those kind of things. But on the other side of things, you know, I love, uh, one of the things I love the most on my journeys is, you know, coming across some very ancient uh, tree up in the subarctic. And I've, in a few cases where a tree has died and fallen over, up in the subarctic i've uh, i've actually sawed off a sample of it and brought it brought it home wow. with me because many yeah. of these trees aren't that large i mean they're like you know this big you can fit it in the palm of your hand yeah uh, but they're yeah. literally centuries old but you know, up in the subarctic the growing season is so short that it's yeah. taken two or three hundred years for them to just grow to the the size of a, a, a sapling in southern canada um so i have uh, you know here with me some black spruce um, that is centuries old that I've gathered in the subarctic. And I think that that's really special. You know, you're wandering across this forest that's a very ancient forest. It's some of the trees, I think some of the oldest trees found in the subarctic go back 400 years and they're still living. And uh, that always impresses me that these trees can survive in that relatively harsh climate because normally when we think of giant trees in southern Canada, uh, we're thinking of the big um, redwoods and Douglas firs and things out in British Columbia, which are, you know, so massive. Uh, four, yeah. five, six, seven feet across, but it's 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 fascinating to see uh, those trees way up in the subarctic that are hundreds of years old. So finding anything like that always uh, makes it feel a little more special to me. And I can imagine too that you know because you are alone, and I think the big part of these journeys that is particularly unique is at least I mean those who have tried to come with you just never have made it along far enough, right? And you're always the one who ends up doing things alone, it seems. And there may be advantages and disadvantages to that. I think you speak really um, eloquently about both of those. But, you know, when you look back perspectives wide in terms of great advance, I and mean, probably some of the greatest advances in the world in science or in, um, I'll, I'll talk science because, you know, that's our area of background, but really anywhere um, have come from those types of individuals who have kind of stepped away from the noise of life. Um, and you can say to think or to be alone. And I guess the point is, is what happens during those moments when you're truly in your thoughts? I mean, from your perspective, are you solving problems all the time? Like, what are you doing in those moments? Because, you know, argument's sake that, let's say, Einstein would spend weeks in silence and then would come back and then would theorize, you know, how he felt the universe worked. And luckily for us that he theorized quite correctly and was able to document it and have the ability to do so. What are the kind of problems you're solving when you're on these on these tours? How much of it, it really is just thinking? Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing that's maybe not immediately obvious. If you think you're going to go, you know, 4,000 kilometers alone across the Arctic, you would think it was just purely a physical problem and there's no right. real mental um, right. problem. But uh, every day on one of those journeys, you're just, you're in your canoe or you're on foot. And I would find that I was constantly confronted with, uh, mental problems that would have to be solved, not necessarily big abstract questions of the universe, but right, right, um, right. There, were all, there were always questions about risk and uh, what was the best decision to be, to be made. For example, I would be canoeing across, you know, vast Arctic lakes that cover hundreds of miles, and I would look at my map, 
and say, you know, I can play this safe and I can stay close to shore and never go more than a few hundred meters offshore. And that way, if the wind picks up or the weather turns bad, uh, I can get to shore safely and get out of the water. Yeah, right. uh, but if you follow the shoreline of these Arctic lakes, it's it's not a straight line at all. It's just riddled with hundreds of bays and indents and islands and peninsulas. So I would do the math and realize that if I actually trace out the shore, this is going to be a 400 kilometer paddle where wow. Wow. if I if I toss the dice and gamble yeah. a little, I yeah. can actually save a, a immense distance by just cutting across big stretches of open water between some pretty big bays, which can be you know 20 kilometers across. Right. Um, so I would constantly be grappling with this dilemma of do I play it safe and cut across the big open water, or do you know what do I do? And uh, I had to weigh a lot of different factors. Is the wind going to shift on me? You know, what's the wind going to do? Is there going to be ice out on the middle of this Arctic lake? and uh what you know what's going to happen so i would constantly do both sometimes i would sometimes i would uh take my chances and cross big open water other times i'd say i, I just can't risk it i've got to fall the shoreline yeah. and that could be stressful just trying to constantly uh weigh you know weigh these decisions and you know measure the wind and decide what best to do now one i'm sure is a question that that many individuals probably wonder about is why do you why do you go alone like why not not, um, take one, two, three, or four people with you. Um, I think I have an idea of what that is, but I'm curious from your perspective um, what it means to be truly alone and what what the advantage is for you to do that. Well, I don't uh, I don't always go alone. I mean, some people right. might think that, but um, I've done <laughs> I've done many expeditions with other people. Uh, right. Most recently, just this last fall, I was doing a canoe trip up in the uh, the Arctic with a friend right. of mine. Okay. And uh, that's usually how it goes on my expeditions is either solo or with one other person, which is considered unusual in expedition circles. I mean, normally mm -hmm. uh, groups of eight to 10 is pretty standard for canoe expeditions in the north. So mm -hmm. even one or two people is considered unusual. Um, there's a few reasons why I do that. Uh, well, there are distinct advantages, I find. One thing that I've really found is that if you travel alone and if you like me, you love wildlife. Uh, you're yeah. going to see a lot more wildlife than you will in a group uh, because partly you're just you're you're making less disturbances you're making less noise but also many of these animals um, are a little less wary of approaching one person than they are in a group so i get to have all kinds of amazing encounters with uh, bears and mock socks and caribou and wolves and right. arctic fox and you know you name it and they'll come around because i'm by myself which in a group they're a little more cautious they're a little more standoffish um, but I mean, partly also, the, I mean, there's something there's something thrilling about the um, the absolute freedom of just being on your own and able yeah. to wander yeah, yeah, for hundreds yeah. of miles uh, yeah. and not cross another uh, footprint. I mean, that is something pretty special. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but I found uh, over the years of doing these expeditions, I quite enjoy it. So to me, the solitude is is kind of um, the ultimate freedom. You know, that you're on your own, you make your own schedule, and you wander at will. Um, wherever you're, wherever you please, where your curiosity takes you. So I do enjoy uh, that part of it. But there's trade trade offs to be sure. I mean, it's a lot harder. Um, mm -hmm. There's no division of labor. So uh, yeah, right. you know, when you have two people, one person can start gathering firewood, the other person can start setting up the tent. Uh, somebody can go and gather water and boil it. So you can, but there's no division of labor. If you're alone, you got to do all the extra work. But the extra work sometimes has extra rewards as well because you're you're getting to enjoy um the freedom and simplicity of just traveling alone you know and i guess that gets back to you know sort of it goes forward to this point right which is um, how long is long enough now you've done some fairly long like multi-day i think i would imagine most of your expeditions are more than a few days would that be a fair fair statement to make yeah, more than a few weeks, I would say. Oh, more than a few weeks. Okay. <laughs> so then, okay. So, so now our viewership, you know, are our healthcare providers who, you know, in in the mindset are thinking, okay, I might have a weekend. What am I going to do in that weekend? Or I might have a day. Um, and then they they don't think beyond, you know, the value. I just they don't think. It's just that it's it's hard for you know people to say I can I can imagine myself taking three, four, five weeks off. Let's just say that's 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 one of the challenges. But here we are. The last three months have basically rendered people, many of in the healthcare profession, you know, uh, in a very different world, a world where, you know, physical distancing policies have, have been such that, you know, you've had a time to read books, you've had time to do many other things just because the access 
to going to, the, in this case, surgeons, operating room, or, or healthcare providers who are providing patient care, but probably 70% reduction in those activities, despite the desire to want to help that just you weren't able to go in and do that. Now they see, oh, we have time, we can do stuff. We, we can do lots of things. Um, what for you do you think are going to be some of the big lessons from this period of, well, I'll use the word social distancing, but I think a lot of it's been physical distancing, just physically distant. You've been, you, I think in many ways have embodied getting away um, and the values of that. What do you think we're going to learn from these last three months? I, I don't know. I mean, the safest bet is we won't learn anything um, or, or we will learn things, but we'll fail to apply them. Um, and people will just go back to the, the same old. But um, I mean, to me, I mean, it's, it's very, very, I mean, it's very interesting and unprecedented uh, time in this world right. to be never more connected all of a sudden to tell people that they have to, uh, you know, stop socializing, essentially. Right. Uh, for me, it was a strange time because I, I've, for a whole my life, I've been saying my favorite thing to do is to be alone in the woods. Right. Um, so that is something I've always uh, I've always enjoyed. But I think I think maybe um, and this is it's difficult to summarize this, but I think that it really shows the value of having um, space in in green space. You know, being able to to get out into nature. Um, is relatively easy depending on where you live in Canada. I mean, m much of rural Canada, maintaining six feet or two meters distance from other people um, is yes. just something you do normally. Normally, uh, right. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be a challenge for me to actually go and find another person and get within <laughs> six feet of them because they're so yeah. far away, I have to go yeah. chase after them. And to me, that's that's one of the great assets is that we have this space. And if I was an urban planner, if I was an urban planner in the GTA yeah. or in Vancouver or Montreal, I'd be thinking right. a lot about how do we make sure we maintain um, green space and parks? Because obviously we saw a lot of our cities, uh, Toronto and elsewhere, they actually shut down those parks and said oh, you can't yeah. go into them because we're afraid that you'll bump into another person. Yeah. And then I think a lot of people in, in the healthcare profession had concerns about well, what's the mental health of, of not going outside, of not getting into nature. And uh, to me, I mean, that I always count it my lucky stars that I live in a place where there's forest all around me. So that was never a, a concern for me. Um, but I think that that, that that is important, that people have a sort of space that they can go. And uh, I would want to make more of those spaces in the city so that we have um, those places people can, can get to no matter what. And uh, I think that's very important, personally. Well, I, yeah, I think that's, a, that, that's actually a really, really helpful insight because... I think what we found is that so much of the hustle and bustle, right? It's just move, move, move. Um, there's a great quote, and I just want to share that with you because I think it gets to the point of sometimes you just need to slow down, take a deep breath, and maybe you know the kind of activities that you do, obviously to a lesser extent, for many people aren't going to have the skill set nor the ability to do multi-week expeditions, but even at a small level, people can get inspired by the work you're doing and think about getting out, maybe journaling, you know, whatever that case may be. But this is, this, this is I thought, was an, uh, interesting. I wouldn't mind getting your take on this particular quote. It says, when it comes to accelerating performance, and, and, you know, and this is the point around, can we, by taking time away, actually get better when we get back, right? It's the concept of just, can we get better at things? There's a paradox. If we want to have greater impact faster, then we have to slow down enough to reflect on what we've done and what we're going to do. That leads me to this concept, and I think on a personal level, I found on small levels, just getting away, um, walks, parks, rides, whatever that may be, a paddle. Uh, you know, I see you do that all the time. Is there value to even, and I suspect the answer is yes, but I'm curious on your take on it. Is there value to even the short break in a day or a week, a few hours just to, to get away, or do you need to have a larger bolus, or is it in your mind, the more you do, uh, it's like it's kind of like a, a you know positive correlation. The more time you, you 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 devote to these sorts of activities and understanding the world around us, the more likely you are to have impact. But is there a minimum amount that you can do and still have some value? Well, I think any time is is uh, is worth unplugging for. I mean, that's yeah. something that I I've always uh, really believed in that if people are stressed out about things, yeah. uh, one of the easiest things you can do to get uh, to minimize stress is actually uh, shutting down your computer, turning off the phone, putting it in yeah. a drawer and closing the drawer yeah. and unplugging and disconnecting from the world altogether. 
and just, you know, go anywhere. You, if you can go outside, all the better. But if you can't, just unplug and, and kind of forget about the world uh, just for a little bit, even if it's only 15 minutes. I mean, you don't have to go away for four months. But that's what I actually find very relaxing is that when I'm on my expeditions, I'm completely cut off. Uh, from the world at large. I mean, the news is non-existent because I never hear it. It's like, yeah. you know, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Well, does news happen if you never hear the news? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. not never, yeah, yeah. I mean, never hearing the news and just being off on my own uh, for a month or a week is actually very relaxing. And I know many people because of their schedules, their professions, that's not realistic. They can't do that. Yeah. Um, but you can do that for a little bit of each day, just completely unplug and forget about the world and uh, immerse yourself in something else. And I think that that's really beneficial. I mean, part, partly that's what people do or they try to do on vacations is they don't answer work emails and then, yeah. you know, maybe they're just gonna forget, but try to do yeah. that almost like every day you're taking a vacation uh, from the world where you're just right. unplugging and forgetting about those things and, and focusing on something totally different. Uh, and I think that that's a, really a, a great relaxation for me personally. Wonderful insights. You know, realizing that we're, we're we wanted to keep this um, you know uh, fairly tight in terms of our discussion today. I have one more question for you, and then that may lead to one other additional. But that's what I'm hoping for is what's next for you? I mean, you've done a lot, uh, and maybe you can speak to it. Maybe you can't. But is there anything that is a sneak peek as to what you're thinking about doing um, in 2021 or the remainder of 2020? Um, I suspect you probably have some ideas of what you're what your your next big uh, adventure may be i actually i have several big <laughs> expeditions planned okay um and there i i can't speak too much about the details of them sure. but i'm ex sure. i'm exploring residence now with the royal canadian geographical society right and i'm working on planning the next five years of expeditions okay. um, which is going to probably include some more epic journeys that will you know span thousands of kilometers and months and uh, also some, other, some books I'm writing. I have a new book coming out next year in 2021. Oh. And it's going to be a little bit different. I think it's going to be an exploration of um, sort of legends of the wild, legends and lore. All those oh. good campfire stories of bear attacks and <laughs> things that go wow. bump in the night, Sasquatch, yeah. Indigos, and uh, where these legends come from. So I'm doing some expeditions uh, focused on retracing some of the, the great uh, sort of ghost stories and campfire stories from the wild. I'm doing more projects about uh, lost explorers, people who vanished uh, oh. in the wild. There's many of those who just, you know, disappeared on the edge of the map up in Northern Canada. And we have clues in journals, but they're kind of like cold cases. People don't know what happened to them. So I'm retracing their routes and uh, some other projects. One of the projects I'm working on right now is about endangered species, the rarest animals in Canada, things like wolverines and lynx, Eastern cougar, animals that you're lucky if you ever see once in a lifetime, even if you spend your lifetime in the wild, and actually trying to track down some of these most elusive animals, birds and things, and, and getting them on camera. Um, wow. So that's an ongoing project that I have. But yeah, it's more more exploration in the wild is uh, all of my projects, you could say. Well, I can't thank you enough for spending a bit of time with us. I I'm sure we will be uh, avidly watching. I certainly will, and we'll make sure that we get the word out. Um, for those of you who um, uh, take a look at this podcast, I really, really urge you to take a look at any of Adam's books. Um, I fall in love with all, all his writing. He writes very naturally and, uh, and you feel viscerally involved with the experience he's having. So we'll make sure that we put that out for you. And I think I'll leave uh, on this one general statement, which I think embodies kind of the spirit of what you do. Sometimes you just need a break in a beautiful place alone to figure everything out. Adam Schultz, Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you very oh, much. My pleasure. Thank you.